I had learned to move beyond charging by the hour to basically saying, hey, what problem are you trying to solve? You know, what is the value of getting that problem right? I'm going to charge you a fraction of that value. You know, should we partner together and do this for you? Hi, I'm James Taylor, business creativity and innovation keynote speaker. And this is The Creative Life, a show dedicated to you, the creative. If you're looking for motivation, inspiration, and advice while at home, at work, or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's an author, musician, entrepreneur, performer, designer, or thought leader. They'll share with you their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, and much, much more. You'll find show notes for this episode, as well as free training on creativity, over at jamestaylor.me. Enjoy this episode. Hey there, it's James Taylor, and I'm delighted today to have on the show Mike McDermott. Mike is the co-founder and CEO of FreshBooks, the world's number one cloud accounting software for self-employed professionals. Built out of frustration after accidentally saving over an invoice, Mike spent three and a half years growing FreshBooks from his parents' basement. Since launching in, 20, in 2003, over 10 million people have used FreshBooks to save time billing and collect billions of dollars. And it's my great pleasure to welcome Mike with us today. So welcome, Mike. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Good. So share, share what's happening in your world at the moment. What's going on? Well, like everyone, um, you're pretty deep into, well, maybe not everybody, but um, you know, it's time of COVID right now. We're about eight weeks in. I'm at home with three children, uh, a four-year-old, a three-year-old, and uh, a three-month-old, and, and my wife, and um, you know, trying to also uh, run a company that we've taken from you know, three offices and uh, you know, two continents. and. <laughs> <laughs> being uh, remotely at home and uh, in breakneck speed but um you know outside of all that 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 you know things are normal <laughs> <laughs> and and as a ceo of, of that that team across those three what would traditionally be over those three different sites were, were most of your team uh kind of remote working like a, a 37 signals type of business or did you still very much have a culture of people kind of coming into a physical place and and spending time together no, we're we're very much um, a culture of 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 being in in the office, and you know, a very culture uh, forward kind of company in a lot of different ways. And so, it's interesting working remotely. And, and the good news is we've hired these people with a great value set and all these kinds of things. But it, it's it's definitely a different experience. And we've got lots of people who are pining to get back to the office. And then we have some folks who think this is the greatest thing ever. <laughs> And, and what is your personal feeling on this? Are you, are you, can you can't wait to get back? Because if, if I was talking to another CEO last week and he said he suddenly for, for the first six weeks, he suddenly felt, oh, OK, this is what retirement kind of must feel like, I guess. And he was starting to quite enjoy it. And then he got to about week six and he was climbing the walls and he said, I just can't wait to get back into the office. And then all the people. <laughs> so where, where are you on this arc? Uh, I think um, that's. Um, I, I don't know how to exactly think about my time frame, but I think the trajectory is is similar. And I am so sick of of Zoom calls. Uh, it, it you know it's uh, just video video calls and doing those for ten hours a day. Uh, that you know I've started reverting back to like, can we just do it on the phone uh, yeah. instead and not having to look at the screen? So, yeah, I, I do think it's a taste of. Um, you know, I guess what retirement air quotes might be like for for some. And I, you know, for my part, you know, I think the the upside of this is, you know, I, I like variety. So being able to do some of this would be great. Just like going to the office, you know, most of the time would be great. Uh, I think it's not an all or nothing kind of thing, but uh, I, I can't wait to get back in and, you know, I just, uh, you know, benefit from, and there's certain work that's just, you know, not as easy to do this way. So tell us, uh, take us back a little bit. I mentioned that the, the, the business started in 2003. Uh, what, what was the, the inception of the business? What were those first few years look like? Well, uh, you know, simply put, I was running a small design firm that I'd, I'd built up and we helped people build their websites and, and then market their offerings through them. Um, I was using Word and Excel to build my clients. I'd studied business in school, which included accounting and finance, all that good stuff. But I knew that I didn't want to uh, use the software that was available. So I, I built myself a, a simple application to invoice my clients and turns out they liked it and um, started playing with that as a side project. Uh, and building it up gradually over time. So I sort of saved over the invoice in 2003, but we didn't launch anything live until 2004. Uh, at the end of 2004, so sort of two years in for me, we had 10 customers paying us about $9.95 a month each. 
<laughs> so a long way from home. Uh, but, um, but we had lots of people signing up every day. We loved it. Ended up moving in my parents' basement for three and a half years. And that was the, the humble beginnings. We crossed certainly 1,000, 2,000 customers in the basement. We were six sort of people when we left, uh, left there. And now we're about 400 people and um, you know, doing pretty well in a variety of, of markets and, and global customers and over 100 countries and uh, over 20 million people have used the software since we started. So as the, that, that time has changed from you know, just you and then six people and then hundreds, and then it kind of went on from there. How do you uh, manage the, the ideas all those people and your, and your customers have about how to improve the service, whether that's features ideas or maybe bigger kind of strategic ideas, partnerships? How do you kind of sort and sift all of that stuff as, as the CEO, as a leader? It, it is a great question, and it's a moving target, and it you know changes as you have different organizational scale and and uh, capability. So uh, you know the, the simplest answer I can give is um, you know I think the thing that's helped us the most is proximity to customer. And what I mean by that is, hey, everyone spends their first month in customer service, or what role you are, CFO, um, chief marketing officer, an engineer. Everyone spends their first month there. And you know, in that you learn some history of the company, but you, you really end up just doing a bunch of phone calls and support tickets with customers and, and starting to better understand our customers and their needs. And so what I found super helpful about that is that's square one. Everyone has the solid foundation. And so generally when we come and decide to release something, it's not a fight like somebody doesn't believe in it. It's they're like, oh yeah, I understand why we're doing that and why now? And you know, thank goodness we're finally doing it because customers need that. So I think that's thing one. And then you know, over time as your organization scales, you know, it, it really gets to like, how do you flow the information around the building so that different teams that have different lenses on you know, the customer and their needs have the opportunity to present those lenses and, you know, have uh, the right amount of mind share to go ahead and make the changes that are necessary. And so, you know, what, what continues to, you know, amaze me over the years is that different channels of communication, whether it be a telephone call, an email, maybe going out to dinner with customers, all yield different kind of feedback. <laughs> uh, and that's existing customers. And then, you know, a sales team is trying to sell a new offering will yield something different than, you know, the customer who's been with you for seven years who calls up and, and wants something done. And so, um, you know, you just need to be sensitive to, you are definitely getting different signals from different audiences and how do we organize things so you can do it. And please excuse the screaming baby in the background. We have a, a, a three month old and I don't know if there's any good way to uh, edit that out or, or avoid it. We, we are, we are, we're in the age of, we're in the age of COVID-19. COVID. I think everyone's a lot more uh, willing to deal with all this side of things now as well. I think uh, I, I, it's, in, it's interesting as you know, you're saying that, um, you mentioned kind of the jump on all these Zoom calls. Do you, do you have a different sense of your employees now and the, and the team around you? Because you're, you're getting that, that look into their homes, into their home lives that you might not have had been able to see before. Well, well I might express it differently, to be honest. <clears throat> I, I think it's harder to get the lens. So you get the, 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 the view in you know, to like a background. And half the time, other people have other backgrounds. And in some cases, I've been cool by that. It was like a really nice condo. <laughs> and it's like, well, it's just a background. So, uh, um, but, but I, where I would go is, you know, part of the job as a, a CEO, especially as you're working through change, everything else, that is to lead and to, you know, be in touch with the employee base to the best of your ability when you're, you know, landing various messages and helping them overcome obstacles. And so uh, I will say, um, I think, you know, when we moved to working remote, we were, you know, doing really well, but we had a couple weekly company meetings where I just felt out of step with what was on people's minds. And, you know, the channels that I would use to go and like get the pulse, you know, weren't really keeping me quite in lockstep. And so I had to go ahead and change instead of walking the hallways and bumping into people and figuring out what's on their mind, how they're responding to something, new programs are going on. You have to work at finding different ways to get that information. And, um, you know, that that's an adjustment that, you know, this all has brought about and, you know, something that I think is a little harder uh, in a world where you don't uh, walk the halls of the office. So what, what have you found to be working? So instead of that management by walking around, you're doing management by, by what, what, what are you finding to feel that pulse of the organization? 
Well, I, I think there's a couple of things. I, I think being deliberative with, you know, the leaders in your team to go like ask. So take time out of the agenda, which you wouldn't have normally had to do and just ask, you know, Hey, what are people seeing? You know, what are we saying? Which is always a good thing anyways. But, but literally if we're just talking about the employee base, making sure you're, you're asking about that. Um, I think there's certain, um, uh, customer oriented, like reporting that we've gone ahead and instrumented. So, you know, we don't have to ask and we can see that. And that's probably been a long term. That'll be stuff we'll want anyways, but we accelerated some of those things. And then, um, and then, you know, I think just, you know, and this is more like, hey, you're working in an organization. These are good hygiene things. But, you know, I've just gone and populated my calendar with a bunch of, of skip levels, which are when you go and meet with a team that's, you know, in our organization, we have a few layers. And so a few layers down and go spend time with those teams, make sure we see that. And then I also have like an office hours open and, uh, you know, weekly it's an hour and I come with no agenda. I just do answers to questions and you know, we're getting 60 or 80 people going to that. So that, that helps me understand what's on people's mind and uh, the kinds of questions they have top of mind for sure. Um, so I, I think it's, it's a collection of things, but it's, you know, it's, it's different ways of getting at it. Now you're a very kind of customer centric organization. It sounds like and this also applies when it, in terms of coming up with ideas, features requests, how do you, once all these different ideas are coming in through various different sources, how do you think about prioritizing? Cause I would imagine it'd be very easy to have like a feature creep of lots of things that different clients are telling you. And maybe some of your developers are, are saying, listen, this would be great if we had this. What is that, that layer? Yeah. How do you kind of look through that and, and sort and sift all of that? So I think, uh, you know, interestingly, and this is probably a terrible answer, but that, that's some of my role, some of my secret sauce. I've been doing this for over a decade. I know our customers really well, and I'm, I'm still sort of intimately involved with product. And so we do get some things that are proposed or some priorities that are surfaced that, you know, I, I think, you know, if you have a little more water under the keel, it's pretty clear that those, those aren't the ones. And so, you know, that, that's me stewarding it, which is a, a, you know, literally a non-scalable way to do things. Um, but then, then I think it's building, you know, the capability in your organization in a variety of variety of ways. And so we do a lot of primary research. So we do a lot of customer research in our software design process. Um, and so we do um, what we call sort of generative research. We'll go ask a bunch of open-ended questions about a problem space. And I'm not on these calls. This is like our design team that goes and does that. And then they, you know, they formulate a bunch of things. And then we'll go and, you know, do some research and get some data. And you start to work up a picture. Um, that understands, you know, first a, a, a segment, which we've gone ahead and defined, and then their needs and, and uh, you know, sort of pain points inside that for, for how they run their business. And then, and then it's a question of, you know, how deep or broad do you go with doing some of these things and sort of methodically chewing through that problem, which is a, uh, um, you know, just, just takes time. And then once you've identified those features or those, those elements you want to add or these new initiatives uh, over time, what have you found in terms of then how you make that into a reality? Are you, are you focused on kind of agile, you know, kind of sprints, that kind of style, or are there other things that you've just found of what would better for you and your organization? Well, I think, you know, I do. Uh, you know, my two cents is no two organizations implement Agile the same way <laughs> or, or, you know, or even probably Waterfall if you want to go there for a second. So, yes, we're a software shop. I don't know how many people are, are in that, but we, we effectively, you know, most teams work on sort of two week sprints um, and, and we sort of sequence. We start with um, problem spaces um, for, for large investment areas and, and kind of some back of the envelope business understanding of why we're doing it is like what is the cost how long it's going to take to deliver it and what do we think comes out of it and the coming out of it could be purely customer satisfaction but maybe it's revenue driving and and then teams go about uh working and delivering those things but before we sign off on any of this there's there's just a huge component of the user experience validation and the market need validation and those are our research talking to customers and and then uh, some modeling that kind of thing so i don't know if that's the perfect answer to your question but I mean, I think that's, that's kind of the, you know, the furthest thing out, it's a one pager describing why we should do it. Then it turns into a pretty refined sort of model with cost times deliverables. And then we roll things out and test them live in market before they're sort of available. So release them to a portion of the population and then, and then uh, they're out there. So that's the high level process. And inside of there are, are sort of iterative two week cycles, delivering stuff and, and prove out uh, incrementally. Now, in your, in your book, you've got a great book called uh, Breaking the Time Barrier that we're going to have a link here for as well, where you talk about 
value and pricing and some of that stuff we often we often maybe don't speak about uh, but as much uh, i've interested one of the areas that you, you speak about in there is about i think about value-based pricing uh and you know and because you have so much access to data you're seeing kind of what's kind of going on different organizations at the moment um how how are those types of organizations that you see that are focused more on that kind of value-based pricing how are they how are they doing just now through this storm that, that we're kind of going through or are you just really are you find that people are really having to kind of drop prices overall for lots of different things and cut lots of lots of prices, or, or do you kind of really have a sense that those companies are really value value based kind of pricing orientated? They're managing to stay in a, a, a pretty good space. But let me do my best to go ahead and answer this question. It might not be uh, the, the the direct response to to how it's phrased. So let me let me go back and say, hey, um, I uh, you know after years of talking with customers. Um, I kept hearing the same things, which is basically how do I price my services? And it, you know, it's it's just an evergreen topic, even if you're good at it. Uh, but most people aren't. And with my consultancy, I had learned to move beyond charging by the hour to basically saying, "Hey, what problem are you trying to solve? You know, what is the value of getting that problem right? I'm going to charge you a fraction of that value. You know, should we partner together and do this for you? Uh, which is, you know, basically value-based pricing in a nutshell. And um, uh, so, you know, I think I would, by the way, I'm just going to go ahead and say it, that book's been downloaded a quarter million times. It's free. It takes 45 minutes. It is written like a fable if you can stomach that, but I would encourage you to read it. Uh, it, it, it was great to see you had uh, Michael Gerber giving, I think, one of the, the blurbs on the book as well, who also kind of wrote his book in that kind of fable style as well. Yeah, I think for the, the, the purpose of the book is to help people have a mind shift around pricing. Yeah, which is a hard topic for people to get their heads around. Sometimes they're really ingrained in how they do things. Other times they just don't even know where to begin. And so the book is about helping you get your head to the right place so that you can start to go and do the things you need to do. Like, you know, how do you set expectations with your clients, all this good stuff. So anyways, I, by the way, with it being 45 minutes, I just, you know, I, if you are, if you are someone who bills, you know, for your knowledge and or for client delivery, if it's not, you know, if you don't get your, your, your time back on that one, uh, you know, that shame on me. Uh, but I, I sort of trust you will. Um, so that's, uh, so that's, that's that. And then your, your question was around, what are you seeing inside your customer base that pertains to people who build by value or, or what have you? And so there I'll go and say, Hey, is like, we just have so much data flying across our platform. We have an infinite number of questions. And while I wrote that book, because it, the lessons I've learned were helpful for me and I thought helpful for others, we don't run the business exclusively thinking, you know, and looking through, through that lens. So I don't have a good uh, numerical answer for you, but what I would say is we've certainly seen a, you know, the volume of invoices going out the door drop. Um, but where we've seen strength are people who have recurring revenue. They set up like client engagements and retainers and that kind of thing where it's, it's ongoing. Uh, and there's just an expectation that it continues. And so those things, and also folks who choose to, you know, collect online forms of payment like credit card and what have you, both the businesses that have done those things have been, relatively more resilient to all this change than, than other folks. Uh, and so, uh, you know, across our, um, you know, across our, our customer base, we're definitely seeing the volume and we, you know, we send billions of invoices every month, uh, the volume in terms of number and, and actual aggregate amount down. Um, and, uh, you know, and then, you know, different, you know, the, the strengths in those, those other areas, people have set up kind of different processes and expectations with their customers. Uh, so that I can speak to and not so much value based uh, in and of itself. And also in the, you talked about, you talked about expect setting expectations, why it's okay to let go of low quality clients. Um, and so do, do you find yourself in, in the, what you do with, within FreshBooks, that, that is a feature that your customer support team are empowered if there is you know they're obviously helping the client as much as possible if there are those clients that are either they just uh they they're just not getting the kind of experience that they they perhaps wanted or frankly they're just not being the kind of clients you want are you are those mm -hmm. your support team empowered to say you know okay maybe you're not at the right place yeah. Um, so, so let's go at this a couple of ways. So I, I think our business, uh, for, you know, for relative to most of the audience, wait, so is, is interesting in some way. And then let's talk about the kinds of businesses who are probably listening. So 
for our customers, you know, if somebody talks to us, let me go ahead and say, we built this massive online accounting software program that is focused on basically less than 10 or 20 employee businesses, many of whom just are themselves self-employed exclusively. And, um, and you know, we, we don't serve retail and we don't serve restaurants today. We're really just for folks who charge for their time and expertise. Okay. So that's full stop. Yeah. And therefore our products a lot simpler and that's why we've sort of had success. And so when people call us up and they're talking with us and we're like, well, our, our offering does this and they're telling us what they need. If, if they don't have it, we fully encourage our support team to say, listen, it's probably just not a great fit for you. Go check out this other thing. And we just believe that's kind of responsible, you know, it's like do no harm is the first, uh, you know, sort of sort of thing there. And it's also good marketing because people really respect that. And one of the things I've found is as soon as you tell them that, well, maybe we're not for you, people are far more interested in learning about you and, and actually often more attracted to trying to work with you, which is very you strange. Pushing away that's, that's humans. Yeah. Yeah. It's the kind of Zen, uh, you know, you seek that, you know, you chase that, which uh, it sort of repels from you. So, so uh, or maybe not repels, but, uh, you know, retracts or however you want to put it. Um, anyhow, so, so yes, we absolutely will not steer you wrong there, uh, full stop. Um, but, but I think this is, this concept is, you know, we are a, a business with like many, many businesses using us. I, I think this is an especially important concept for, for folks who run agencies and bill for their time and expertise. Um, you, you may start out just trying to get, like, I think of it as like you start out trying to get a single customer <laughs> and then, and then you often get to a place where you have too many. And then you really often start to refine. And that's where you start to say, okay, I have more customers than I can handle well. And some of them I get less satisfaction from or revenue or whatever it is that I'm going to use as my metric for success. And you start to kind of edit folks down to the, the, the best customers. Um, and I think that that is, that is always kind of the goal with an agency uh, or a firm or a consultancy, however you want to put it. Um, that is, that's, that's always the job. You're constantly trying to refine down to a better and better segment of customer. Um, you know, some folks like to get to a certain size and stay put other ones want to grow. And, you know, I think it's even more important. The bigger accounts become even more uh, targeted. It's almost like, almost like an artist where a young artist, you want to experiment, create lots of different types of art, different mediums. You then gradually over time, you find what, what is working and you kind of start to pair back the tools that you use and start to pay back the kind of people that you want to create art for as well. So it's not just a bit uh, of the art side as well. A hundred percent or an athlete. I try an a athlete. lot of sports and, yeah. you know, like I, I think almost any discipline it's, it's the beginner's mindset. I don't know anything. I'm going to progress. I'm going to learn. And then, okay, I can start to hone in. And I think that's very true with, with bringing on customers as well. So as we start, kind of start to finish up here, I'd love to know, uh, you know, obviously we're going to have links to uh, FreshBooks. We're going to have a link to breaking the time barrier so people can go and download that as well. Um, are there any kind of uh, online resources or tools or apps you find particularly useful for doing the work that you do? Obviously, we, we've already, already had that conversation about Zoom. You're probably not uh, thinking about but are, yeah. are, there, are there things that you're still finding that you enjoy just you know, tactically or just kind of working with and, and actually brings you joy rather than something, oh, I, I'm going to have to go back into that tool or use that device again. Yeah, well, I, my answers are generally fairly mundane with this stuff. So by the way, I think the Zoom has been a transformative tool for us, you know, working with, you know, more locations and more people. So I think it's just everything in moderation. So it is a great thing. Uh, there's no question there. Um, you know, I, I, the place I like to go with questions like this is often, you know, hey, my moleskin and my ballpoint pen, <laughs> right? Like if I'm really going to get my thoughts together and kind of build the to-do list and then go ahead and have the satisfaction of crossing them off, nothing beats per for me. Yeah. Um, and then if you're going to digital tools, like I, I mostly, you know, and this is the, the sad truth, like, you know, not too much that's hugely novel. And, you know, I, I'm kind of working various productivity packs. So we're on G Suite now. And I spend a lot of my time in those things. And, you know, if you're not already using them, you know, the, 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 the level of collaboration you can have uh, through those platforms is great. Um, and, you know, I think especially as you work with more and more people. So um, those, are, those are pretty sort of boring answers. If I try to think of like, you know, one little app or something like that, I, 
you know, I generally come up uh, short. Uh, oh, I, th I, th I think I think Moleskin is always is, is a very very useful app. It is a great app to have. Um, and what about if you to recommend one book and one album to our listeners? Not one, Ooh. not one of your own books, but Ooh. a book by another author that's maybe inspired you. You've you've gifted more often than others. What would that book and then what would the album be or the record? Well, <clears throat> okay. So um, you know, I always like to seek to understand who, who the audience is. And I think that often will, will change the answer and or what problem they're trying to solve. And so, um, and the album one is the one you got me excited on that one. I hadn't anticipated that big music fan, but now, geez, I don't even know where to begin with that one. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, with books, I, I think a lot of, if, you, if you're an entrepreneur and you're sort of looking to get going and think about scaling, you know, it was Michael Gerber who you mentioned, earlier is probably the one I recommend the most. I think there's some really in those foundational stages of getting a company going and then thinking about how to set it up for success. You know, that story does walk people through some of the really important uh, mental models and kind of obstacles and hurdles in a good way and talks about the importance of you know, key roles of like the technician and the manager and the entrepreneur and all of that stuff is um, stuff often small teams need to work through early on. And so, you know, I would go with that. Um, uh, and it, it is probably the one I, I, I recommend the most. Um, as for, um, as for albums. <laughs> oh man. Is, 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 has, really been a, has there been a coronavirus album that's kind of getting you through this just now? <laughs> Maybe uh, oh, you go for a run so or like a walk or. A, a recency dimension. So, so let's go there. I will, um, I, maybe I'll shed some light on a, a great Canadian artist that's probably less known to folks, um, Bahamas, who my kids like, uh, but I also like as well. And so I would consider it, um, you know, there's certain music I want to listen to when I'm at the beach and like Bob Marley probably lives there uh, as well as a few other things. But Bahamas kind of lives there as well. It's very uh, kind of good sit by the, the, the beach kind of kind of music and, and my kids uh, who are young also like it so it's it's getting some airplay around meal time around here because everybody's happy uh, <laughs> so let's go with that life <laughs> is alfie is the album i started with and there's uh, there's a few of bar chords is another good one if you haven't heard of them check it out really really good stuff and a final question for you i want you to imagine mike you wake up tomorrow morning and you have to start from scratch so you've got all the tools of your trade all the knowledge you've acquired but no one knows you and you know no one what would you do how would you restart things so I have no network, but I have my knowledge. You do. Mm. Um, I would go find a customer. It's to be served and I would serve them. That is what I would do. Fantastic. Well, Mike, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Where is the best place for people to go to learn more about you and, and all of what you, you're doing at FreshBooks? Yeah. So yeah, please, please go check us out at, at freshbooks.com. You can, uh, um, uh, you can go and, uh, yeah, sign up for a free trial there. You know, if you're using Word or Excel or a piece of accounting software you find cumbersome, you, you probably have been looking for us your whole life and just don't know it. So please go check it out. If you ever need help, we're really big on customer service. Fire us an email, please pick up the phone. We would love to help you. And, you know, we have uh, customers all over the world and, and uh, you know, they, they're very, very high nip, like the satisfaction rates. Please just give us a try. So I go there and you can find, find more about me there if you're interested in that kind of thing. Or I'm also active on Twitter at just uh, at Mike McDermott. Mike, thanks so much for coming on the show today. And we're going to have a, also a link to Breaking the Time Barrier. People can go and get downloaded their copy of the book as well. And I wish you and your family all the best during these times. You as well, James. Thank you very much. If you're interested in living a more creative life, then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high-performing creatives use. I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me. That's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.